Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, mahaba, moni moli wanji, namaste, jambo. Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jedley, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted and honored that you are joining us in our mission to help kids and families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, wherever you find your podcast. We have two great guests for you today. Patty Donnelly is here to celebrate the Vanishing Lake. And Wendra Lynn will be celebrating the wondrous cloud forest. Before we invite our guests into the studio, we want to invite you to go to our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Please be sure to sign up for our newsletter. Find out what's coming up on the podcast. Find out what you might have missed that you want to catch up on. And also find out what's going on in our live event and, and, and sign up for our book giveaway. So much to do at readingwithyourkids.com. Joining us right now from Belgium, we are here to celebrate a beautiful picture book called The Vanishing Lake. Please welcome to the show, Patty Donnelly. Patty, how are you? I'm doing good. Thanks very much for having me. I'm really excited to have you on uh, The Vanishing Lake. We've uh, had the publisher of The Vanishing Lake, Helen Wu, on the show in the past. And, uh, want, and, and we also featured The Vanishing Lake in our Reading in the New Year virtual uh, literacy event. Uh, but The Vanishing Lake for the virtual literacy event was uh, read aloud in Chinese. And as I understand it, The Vanishing Lake was first published in Chinese. It was indeed, yeah. Um, uh, Yihu Press, the publisher, they publish in in both in China and, and in the U.S. And, um, and The Vanishing Lake, uh, yeah, actually came out first in China, I believe, last year, uh, 2020, in, in August, September or something, uh, sometime around then. Um, so it came out there um, first, and it's coming out in English in, uh, on April 20th, uh, 2021, so, uh, but, which is very exciting. But, yeah, it's, it's pretty fascinating that um, it's already been out there um, in Chinese and... and from what I hear from the, the publisher, it's, it's doing well and seems to have been well received in China. So, so that's really great to hear. Yeah. What was that like, um, having, having your book first published in, in Mandarin Chinese? I mean, yeah, it's, it's fascinating to see the, the, the cover of it and, and, uh, you know, the whole story on the insides. Um, in, you know, it looks like such a, it's such a beautiful language when it's, uh, written down. So it's amazing to see my, my artwork there really, you know, integrated, or the text really integrated into um, into my artwork. So, uh, yeah, that was that was fantastic. So, tell us a little bit about the story of the Vanishing Lake. <laughs> Certainly. So, um, as I said, it's it's based on a on a real lake, and it's um, uh, back home uh, in Ireland. It, there's this lake called Loch Arima, and it actually disappears and reappears every few days so it, it rains a lot in, in Ireland um, uh, that's why it's so green but uh, yeah this lake just fills back up when it rains and then it um, I, I believe it's uh, there there are a lot of um, uh, hole the, 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 the mud is very porous and so it so it drains away and um, so it's uh, it's pretty magical that that you can drive past it in the morning and it's full and drive past it in the evening and um, uh, and it's completely gone. So that that always was a pretty fascinating um, thing. Uh, or actually, growing up next to it, it probably wasn't really that fascinating. It was just kind of normal, you know, on your doorstep that this that this happened. I remember as kids, you know, if we uh, if my parents would be driving past it, we always try to guess if it was going to be there or not. Um, but it's become more fascinating to me as an adult uh, thinking about it that it's. You know that's a pretty fascinating thing, especially living away, uh, away from it now for a number of years. Uh, so I thought it would be a great idea for a for a, 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 ch- a picture book story, and I thought I could create some nice um, artwork uh, for it. And I thought the title itself, you know, the Vanishing Lake, you know, that's what it's called back home. Um, I thought that was pretty intriguing. So the story, the story that I came up with was there's um, a grandfather who lives uh, by the lake, and his granddaughter. Uh, Mira comes to uh, 
uh, visit him. And that, of course, the lake disappears and reappears and disappears and reappears. And she has, she wants to know why this is happening and she keeps asking him. And each time he asks, he has a fantastic magical <laughs> story, a fantastic reason of um, mermaids and giants and, and all sorts of things. Um, but she's pretty uh, reluctant to believe any of these and, and thinks um, that, uh, that he's just uh, making them up. <laughs> and so she's, um, yeah, she goes in search uh, of trying to find the real reason. Uh, and it's about her kind of opening up her imagination a little bit and, and maybe not being so so stuck in um, kind of the facts mm -hmm. and uh, and just kind of uh, yeah being open to to just kind of kind of more magical stories um so yeah that's um uh, that's the vanishing lake that's neat that's neat i i love that it uh, revolves around relationship between a grandfather and granddaughter i think those are that the intergenerational relationships are i think are really kind of magical when you um, you have that relationship and it's really, really close, but I'm not your mom, I'm not your dad, so you can be a little, you know, test the boundaries with me a, a little bit yeah. more. You know that I'm, I'm still going to love you. Um, you, you know, I'm not going to, you're not going to make me pull my hair out. Uh, well, not that I have any left, but uh, yeah. it, it, it seems like a really neat relationship to base a story on. Yeah, I think definitely the relationship between grandparents and grandchildren is an interesting one because, well, grandparents are, are at a certain point in their life where they're probably maybe maybe not going to work anymore and they have so much more free time than when they were parents and they're probably in a lot more of a reflective time in their life and and uh, yeah, they're kind of all about the fun and you know the the child gets to you know go back to the parents at the end of the day and so they're, they're probably you know grandparents are a lot more um you know uh, just up for for a uh, fun time um than you know when you're a parent you have work and stresses and, and mortgages and all sorts of things that are you know kind of pulling your attention in all different directions and it's maybe tougher to have that complete freedom and and um playfulness so i think the relationships between grandparents and grandchildren is is um an interesting one plus the 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 story so i needed her to go to the lake and um so i knew there there would have to be uh you know a child character for for kids to identify with in the story um and i i, I wanted the place that she would visit to be familiar in some way but she couldn't live at the lake because then you know, she would she would see it every day. So it had to be sort of familiar, but it had to be um, a, a special kind of thing that she would go and visit uh, this lake. So placing her, making her grandfather live there kind of, um, uh, you know, was a nice um, nice way to do that. It is an interesting choice uh, in, in terms of the relationship with the girl and, and the lake. Um, I, I know there, there are some places in the world like the vanishing lake um in in new brunswick in canada there's in a bay where it the tide when it goes out it just strands boats and it just goes out for miles and you know what was once a deep <laughs> deep harbor is now just, just land you can walk out there mm -hmm. but people who live nearby these phenomenal places it becomes an everyday thing so it loses some of the magic so i think that was a, a really wise choice to have somebody who is familiar with the lake and visits a lot but is not there every day where it becomes mm -hmm. not special yeah yeah i mean because because i had forgotten so i grew up right beside the the real vanishing lake and um i had definitely not thought about it in years and not re and whenever we were kids it was really normal that that that, that was there and it's only from living living away from home for a number of years that uh, thinking that when I go back and visit or, or just thinking about um, this uh, these sorts of things um, I could see with fresh eyes that that this is uh, you know something really magical or there's something magical about it uh, and it's um, you know Ireland is just completely full of mythical stories and storytelling is a, a is such a, a huge part of life but also the the natural landscape is really 
it seems like it's from another time and and around, close to the vanishing lake there there are also a number of other you know mythical places and there's um there's a place called the giant's causeway um with um very close to the the real vanishing lake and uh it there are all these hexagonal um stones that are at the coast seemingly going out to sea uh, and it's called the giant's causeway and the 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 myth is that there was a, a giant called Finn McCool and he, he lived there and he wanted to build a bridge <clears throat> over to Scotland um, to fight another dra- uh, another giant. And um, so he built this um, uh, this causeway, all these stones, and um, he went over and then he discovered uh, that the other giant was way bigger than him. So he <laughs> came back and there's a whole story about him dressing himself up as uh, as a baby giant and then the the Scottish giant sees the size of him as a baby and so he doesn't want to wait around for the the real giant to come back so the Scottish giant goes back and uh, he destroys the, the the bridge and so there's only a little part left kind of going out to sea nowadays and I think there's also a little part in Scotland so it sort of sort of adds up a little bit um but yeah all of this is like you know a few minutes from where I grew up and uh, and many other places like that really natural beautiful natural um uh, uh phenomenons and and um so it's just kind of deep steeped in in all these mythical stories um but yeah so it's it's as you, uh, if you grow up there that's all just normal life but mm-hmm. uh yeah it's uh, it's it's fun to write uh, make up st- more stories about these sorts of things I'm I'm curious. Uh, are are you thinking about um, f- doing a sequel? Maybe telling that Giants Causeway story. Um, I ha- I haven't thought about uh, something uh, about other stories, kind of other mythical stories um, uh, in Ireland. I do have my my uh, second author illustrated picture book, uh, which will be coming out uh, in spring 2022. Um, so it, that's with the same publisher, and it's. Um, it's called dodos aren't extinct and it's all about these uh extinct animals who who maybe aren't uh really extinct They're, they've just been in disguise uh, uh-huh. all of this time and it just goes through all of these these different you know saber-toothed tigers and mammoths and and dodos and everything who are just kind of hiding out in plain sight so that that's um that's a kind of funny one that's that hopefully um uh, kids will find uh, funny to to consider that maybe these you know if they're out and about in their daily lives that maybe they might think that that's something you know there might be a mammoth lurking somewhere and I think that that um, uh, that's something that really does appeal to me um, having hidden things or, or uh, in your in my illustrations and in my stories um, and especially. I, I had another picture book called Here Be Dragons, uh, written by Susanna Lloyd mm-hmm. uh, and illustrated by me. And uh, it came out in February this year. And uh, the basic story there is uh, there's a knight um, and he's off to find a dragon. He has a map and, and he knows he's very confident that he's going to find find this dragon. And the it's written in the first person and he's talking about, OK, uh, here's, you know, the, the first thing to look for is this. And, and he's saying, um, he's going through the whole story really confident, but he can't find any, uh, any dragons, but in the illustrations, it's completely different because he's walking, he's actually walking up a hill, but it's the back of the dragon and he's ah. stepping over things and he's, you know, he's screaming into a cave, but it's, it's actually the dragon's nostril. And, uh, <laughs> so the, the kids reading the book, will pick up on it really quickly and will be, you know, two steps ahead of, of the night in the story. But the text is all completely, um, you know, he's, he's saying, oh, there's, there are no dragons around here anywhere. And, and he walks, he walks into the dragon's mouth and everything. And so, uh, all of the animals and, um, around him in the countryside, they all know what's going on and the kids knows what the kids know what's going on. And, um, so I got to work. It, that was a really interesting relationship between um, text and image. And I got to tell a completely different story with the illustrations, but I got to have, you know, I got to have my story with, uh, uh, with the kids reading it, like they could follow along and I got to leave lots of little clues. You can see the tail kind of 
rising up and you can see teeth and smoke and, and all sorts of things um, that kids can, you know, feel that they're, they're one step ahead of, uh, of the, the main character. Um, so, yeah, those kind of books, I think, appeal to me. So, like, in The Vanishing Lake, there are a lot of hidden clues and, and um, uh, to, to what's going on. And, and next year, the, the Dodos Aren't Extinct one is, is also kind of plays on that. Wonderful. Kirby Dragons as well. I think that's what appeals to me. So hopefully um, any future stories uh, I work on will, will also kind of be in that, that direction. Awesome. Hey, tell everybody, please, where they can go to find out more about you and find out more about all the books that you're involved with. Yeah, so I, I, I'm on Twitter uh, at Patty Donnelly and I'm on Instagram just at Patty. And uh, my website is left.com, L-E-F-F-T. And you can you can see all my books there um, and what I'll be working on. And uh, yeah, I, I, hopefully I'll have a lot more to share, uh, a lot more books coming coming in the future. So Awesome. We've had a great time speaking with the author of The Vanishing Lake, Patty Donnelly. Patty, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. It's, it's been great. We hope you enjoyed our conversation with Patty Donnelly. We also hope that you connect with us on social media. Facebook.com slash reading with your kids at Jedly Magic on Twitter and at reading with your kids on Instagram. You know, there's so much interest in being on the reading with your kids podcast. We can't fit it all on the podcast. That's why we have our great newsletter at reading with your kids.com and also why we are so active on those social media platforms. Right now, let's welcome Windra Lynn. We're really excited joining us right now from Round Rock, right outside of Austin in the state of Texas. Our guest today is the author of a beautiful rhyming uh, picture book called The Wondrous Cloud Forest. Please welcome to the show, Wendra Lynn. Wendra, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. I'm excited to have you on. Uh, tell us... Uh, about the wondrous cloud forest. This is a really beautiful book. Well, it's it's about one of our Earth's most magical yet endangered places in Papua New Guinea. And um, I wrote the book because I wanted children and parents to be able to talk together about climate change and endangered species in a way that was optimistic and gave them um, some ideas about how they can also help. How did you get interested in um, in the cloud forest and in writing about this issue? Well, I first was introduced to the tree kangaroos, which are the flagship species of the cloud forest at the Woodland Park Zoo in Seattle, where I was living at the time. And they are just such adorable little animals that I fell in love with them. And I had been painting with watercolors, and so, of course, I had to paint them. And um, I, a friend was visiting, and some coffee spilled in my studio. And my friend, who is now my husband, said, have you ever tried painting with coffee? And so I, I started painting with coffee and, of course, saw the correlation between their, the tree kangaroo's beautiful coffee-colored fur. And so I had started doing these paintings and ended up at a party where I met the um, woman who, uh, Lisa Dayback, she is the founder of the Tree Kangaroo Conservation Program, which um, helps not just the tree kangaroos, but uh, helps protect the whole cloud forest. And it happened to be the anniversary of their program, and so my paintings were used for um gifts in the gift shop, t-shirts, etc. And then one thing led to another. I just kept imagining these beautiful little creatures and stories about them, and I wanted to share them with the world. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I got and I, I did the research, and so I went online, and I saw what a, a tree kangaroo is. But I have to tell you, when I first, you know, when we first started corresponding with each other, and I, I had this vision of, like a full-size kangaroo jumping in the trees. And I'm like, how does, how does that work? Can you tell us a little bit more about the tree kangaroo? Yes. Um, so they're, they're miniature little tree kangaroos. They look like plush toy animals. They have very long tails that keep them balanced in the trees. And they hang down, and they're very elusive. It's, 
In fact, Lisa Dayback, she traveled to Papua New Guinea um, for, I think, over eight years before actually seeing one. Um, it's very hard to, to come in contact with them. Now with, um, I think, they have critter cramp, critter cams, and they have new technology through Microsoft and um, I think uh, National Geographic are working together so they can actually track them. And so now with also the help of the local people that used to hunt them, that no longer need to hunt them because they have income from selling their coffee, and that's why I paint with the coffee. So back to the tree kangaroos. Sorry, I'm a very nonlinear thinker. I have to stay on track. They have very large padded feet, so they can jump very high from like 60 feet and land safely on the ground. They do leap between the trees easily. Um, at first, when they were trying to locate them, all they would see would be like a scratch on the side of a, a tree bark, and they knew they were in the area because um, they're so elusive, and they blend right into the, the moss and the trees. They have that beautiful coffee color, which is the same color as – um, the soft moss that hangs in the trees. So they, you know, that's how they protect themselves. Yeah. Um, they're, I think they're quiet. I, I, yeah. So there's ways in, in the book and there's um, at the zoos, they can help you learn more about the tree kangaroos. Yeah. Neat stuff. They are really adorable animals. Um, I can absolutely understand how you fell in love with them. Why do you think it's important for families to talk about climate change? Well, I think it's important for everyone to talk about climate change, personally. Um, um, but I also think, just on a bigger scale, loving the planet and and um, having um, a reverence for just nature um, connects one also more deeply to themselves, and it's one of the things that, that I use for meditation. And so whether or not, I mean, there's some, you know, controversy. Some people don't think that it's man-made climate change, but whether or not it is, cultivating um, respect and, and a love for nature just broadens your life in so many ways, and we're all connected and I think that um, because climate change can be so daunting, being able to talk about it and discuss ways that you can help and understand it and, get, and understand the animals um, is important. Communication increases our, our understanding. And, yeah, I'm all about increasing communication and inspiring people to feel um, – creative in their way in which they approach um, subjects that are, you know, can be overwhelming, like climate change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, it, it's interesting that you really kind of focus on uh, having conversations that are positive, because uh, when we hear about climate ch change, a lot of times it's like we have three years to make some changes or that's it. It's you know, lights out, um, you, you're looking at it in, in a very different way. Why is it important for you to be optimistic, um, especially when we're talking with our kids? Well, that was one of the beauties about this particular situation that really um, struck me was that uh, Lisa Daybeck had, was studying the tree kangaroos, and she, she found that the, by connecting people, there was a solution not only for the animals that she loved, but that would bring more income to the people living there and on a larger scale also can um, help to protect the cloud forest and conservation, which in turn helps the whole planet. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I grew up on the West Coast. I I've, was brought up learning about ecology. You remember the ecology sign? Mm -hmm. I don't know where that went. but <laughs> uh, I uh, had always, as a little girl, you know, wondered what, What's going to happen with, you know, as a child, you love animals and it was a child in all of us. And so it, it always had felt daunting to me. So when I started to see people like Lisa with these creative solutions, I felt hopeful and I wanted to share that hope with other people. And I started to realize that everyone in their own way 
can contribute just by raising awareness, whether you're an artist or a musician or a writer or a biologist or an executive, whoever you are, you can um, create conversation and bring your perspective to the uh, solutions for things that um, seem really daunting when you think about approaching it on your own. What kind of things can we do? Most, the podcast has been heard all around the world, which is amazing, and, and on every continent, including Antarctica. But most of the folks who are listening to the podcast are in the United States or Canada, the United, United Kingdom, France. How can those of us living in, in, in the States, in, in, in Europe, do uh, what, what can we do that can positively affect the cloud forest in Papua New Guinea or Costa Rica or Brazil? Well, I mentioned some of these things in the back of the book. Um, for, first of all, visiting zoos, um, I think that people uh, need to understand that most zoos these days and all zoos that are part of the AZA and the WAZA, which are uh, associations for zoos and aquariums, their main missions now is to um, provide protection for animals and their habitats around the world. So they're doing research and rehabilitation. And so when you visit a zoo, you're really um, contributing and, and um, helping raise funds for, the, for their work. Um, also, for in Papua New Guinea specifically, um, I, as I mentioned earlier, they – at the zoos and online, you can find um, what's called use. Uh, it's, it's initials for the, their conservation co- coffee, which is grown by um, the local people in Papua New Guinea in lieu of deforesting and hunting endangered species. You can also raise awareness. Um, like with me, I paint with the coffee, and I teach others, and I do events. So you can I, you could bake with the coffee, and you could share that with your friends and families and and educate them about um, the cloud forest and so those are just a few ways wow I, now you you mentioned that you paint with coffee I, you know I've certainly um, uh, been part of, of of moments where coffee is spilt on a you know paper paper uh, tablecloth or whatever so I know that that, that you can certainly make a mess with coffee. I've never heard of <laughs> painting with coffee. How would we? How, how would we start? Just grabbing a cup of coffee and a paintbrush and going at it, or is it a little bit more complicated? Um, well, yeah, you. It's it's actually uh, quite simple if if you have the um, if you've painted with watercolors before. The important part is that you need watercolor paper because. Um, the coffee does respond really well to the watercolor paper, and um, making a mess, as you said, is part of the fun. And I think that, you know, I like often start with spilling a little bit and seeing where it takes me onto the paper. And then you can sprinkle the coffee, and you can use darker, richer tones if you're using some thicker, if you make your coffee very thick. And it, it's, I love it because it's the, the tones are so beautiful and warm, but it's also monochromatic. So... For someone like me who tends to do lots of broad thinking, it helps me focus in and, and just on the subject that I'm painting. Um, and I also, I teach um, watercolors and coffee painting, so you can add the, the coffee to your watercolors to give an overall sepia tone, which is lovely. So anyone who's interested can visit my website and talk to me about, I do private parties and introduce you to coffee painting so you can take off on your own and continue to explore it. What a, what a neat idea, um, painting with coffee. And I'm imagining that that would be a, uh, you know, just a great time uh, to, to have those conversations about where did this come from? Okay. We, 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 bought the coffee at the supermarket maybe, or maybe we ordered it online. But beyond that, it before it, it ended up in that can or that bag, it started yeah. life. Can, can you kind of share yeah, with well, us? Another co- interesting thing about coffee, and it, it's, it's interesting once you get on these roads of things that you're passionate about. Coffee is, I think, it, maybe the second or the third. It's, it's one of the world's largest uh, commodities that's, that's, you know, inter- 
exchanged and, you know, worldwide. And coffee is a tradition all over the world where people come together, as you were just saying, just to visit and to have conversations. And that that is uh, part of the thread that's uh, educating people about the cloud forest and in many places like the rainforests and where um, people live who are in these um, more rural communities, um, it's connecting them to people in cities and allowing everyone to work together. So, yeah, I think that it's pretty magical that coffee is the vehicle for this expression and communication. Yeah, it, it really is. Uh, my beautiful wife and I visited um, Costa Rica and some coffee plantations in Costa Rica, and it was amazing to to discover uh, how much that beautiful country depends on coffee. It, it's uh, a, a huge part of their economy to the point where uh, the, the, the government decided that, hey, we can, we're only going to grow this one certain type of coffee because that way it's protected. I guess the, that the other brands don't, uh, other types don't damage that this, this one, mm-hmm. one, one crop. Um, really fascinating. And what a neat thing that the folks in, um, Papua New Guinea who had been hunting the tree kangaroos made the decision to stop that and then start growing and harvesting coffee. Yes, the people there are have really become the stewards of their own land, and they have created a huge conservation area with the government and um, the Tree Kangaroo Conservation Program, which I met through the Woodland Park Zoo and Lisa Daybeck. Um, they helped facilitate this, um, but really it's in the hands of the local people, which is just so wonderful. Um, and that, that probably makes it more effective. Yes. Yeah. Wow, neat. I, I, I'm really excited. I, I know that, uh, as you mentioned, your um, your website and the fact that you teach, and, and that's really neat. Can you let everybody know where they can go to go online to, to find out more about your classes and your books and all of that neat stuff? Yes, thank you for asking. My website is um, by Wendra, B-Y, uh, and my name, W-E-N-D-R-A dot com. Well, we've had a wonderful time speaking to the author of The Wondrous Cloud Forest, Wendra Lynn. Wendra, thank you so much for being part of our show today. Thank you for having me. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be Laura Shermer celebrating Kita and the magic paint. Hey, want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, we want to thank our guest, Patty Donnelly. Be sure to check out The Vanishing Lake. Also, Wendra Lynn. Be sure to check out The Wondrous Cloud Forest. I want to thank my team, Alejandra Doherty, Fatima Khan, Justina Thompson, Helen Fraser. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to join together to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. Thank you so much for helping your children get through this crazy past 16 months of pandemic lockdown. And thank you so much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast.